Today's passage needs to be understood and taken in the larger context of what the Lord teaches. Because when we hear him say, do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. But he himself is the Prince of Peace. He's the one who, in another passage, he tells the disciples that when they go to evangelize, they are meant to bring peace. And St. Paul says, he's our peace who brought two different uh, parts of the world of humanity together. How to understand it? First is that the Lord coming to our lives, he really wants clarity in our lives. And at the same time, he says, look, not everyone will welcome my offer of salvation. There are those with whom we'll never be able to, let's say, be friends, to have an agreement to understand each other because there are those who are also the sons of darkness. And as we remember in other passages, uh, he would say there will be those who will reject you. And the disciples going to Jerusalem and passing through Samaria were rejected. It's a part of the entire mission of the apostles. We cannot pretend that Everybody will embrace the message of Christ and what ensues and the consequences of uh, welcoming the Lord. No. And further on in our world, in our culture, where it's now out front against Christ, against the values, very liberal, very left-leaning, there, there are clear values that oppose Christ. Which means you cannot reconcile being the follower of Christ and at the same time upholding certain values like abortion, euthanasia, gender ideology. You cannot. These are things that are completely uh, beyond reconciliation. It's almost like to say, well, I follow Christ, but now I will uh, throw an atomic bomb and erase half of the humanity. It doesn't work. We may have the spirit of and here is a very important word, of antichrist. Not of Christ. What does it mean, antichrist? There are a lot of people, politicians, they speak beautiful words, even our president who is Catholic, but he is full-fledged ahead for Satan. We know it. It's clear. It's out there. But if we shut our uh, minds saying, oh, that's fine. But for the sake of peace, let's not say anything. The Lord never compromised with sin. That's important for us to know. I met many families, and here specifically it is being um, named, where the parents compromised with sin and actually threw their children straight into the devil's dens. And they come to you to ask for prayers, obviously. I mean, dude. You threw your own kids to the devil's den. Why? By certain decisions. And the Lord says, no, I'm not negotiating with evil. Did, did you realize that not even once he was entering a conversation with the devil? It was always a command and out. Command and out. He never said, oh, let's have a conversation. Let's dialogue. Let's see how we can uh, work things out. I can give you part of the world and I can take another part, whatever you like. I mean, just to have a tranquility. It doesn't work with, with the Lord in this way. And that's why the Lord says, look, I'm coming. And as a doctor who will enter with, let's say, scalpel operating, will separate the dead tissue from a live tissue. He will remove the tumor, but because he wants to save a patient. That's why he says, 
a mother against her daughter and a daughter against her mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. There will be those who will ultimately embrace darkness. And that's clear for the Lord because he knows that the end of embracing darkness is eternal damnation. We heard in the first reading, St. Paul saying that the path of submitting and of offering one's own members at the service of sin is death. You may say physical, and I already explained, is the death of one's own being, eternal damnation, the second death, as the book of uh, Revelation calls it. And that's why Jesus Christ, he says, I have come to set the, the earth on fire and how I wish it were already blazing. The fire is the Holy Spirit. Once it's introduced, as St. John Paul II says, the first sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit is that you start distinguishing evil from good. You have a clarity of where um, the Lord is and where the evil one is at work. Because the Spirit shows us the love of God, infuses this love, but at the same time convicts us of sin. Where there is, a, for example, a mix of uh, uh, truth and lie, I can tell you immediately that's a clear sign there is no Holy Spirit. There could be a lot of singing, there could be a lot of uh, friendliness and good group, but no Holy Spirit. Why? Because he himself said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he says, Son, daughter, this is not good what you're doing. This is not right. This is not right. <laughs> but I don't like to hear that. Well, I need to tell you before you slide straight to hell. We don't like this language because we are used to an approach which means anything goes and we embrace tolerance at any cost. But not even once the Lord said, be tolerant with people and that way you will reach salvation. He says, love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. But why would they persecute me? I'm mean, such a good person. Well, precisely because following Christ, there will be people who will dislike you and will not uh, settle for what Christ is teaching. We are reaching a point, my dear brothers and sisters, where um, we'll have to take a stand we we'll cannot play double. That's why Benedict XVI, our Holy Father, and other popes before, they were saying that now Christianity is diminishing rapidly and will be preserved in small communities of the believers, but who will not be compromising with sin. A little bit here, a little bit there, whatever is convenient, whatever I like, whatever I dislike. No, no, this is of no use. You might remember from history, there was an event called the French Revolution in France that was a hemorrhage to an extent you would not believe. The same happened in Spain, in other parts of the world. And one may say, how would God allow such a, a destruction of the churches, of the convents and murders and so on? Where was God in all that? And you know what Benedict XVI answers? God purifies his church. And it was needed. Do you think that we need a lot of temples, 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 convents and groups? And No, we don't. And that's why we see the northern part of the U.S. The churches are being sold, consolidated, left. Is it a tragedy? I don't think so. Actually, the Lord is purifying things. He doesn't need more groups, more churches, more organizations. For what? There's no need. What is the need of is those who don't play games with sin, who really want salvation and sanctification. All those who say, oh, I like it. I like my coffee after mass. I like my group. I like my thing. No, no, no. This is a baloney. This is what Benedict XVI once again says is just a theater uh, decorations, but at the end there is nothing inside. How many parishes and uh, communities will last? Those who will remain strong in the Lord, leaning on His grace, and as we found out in the second reading,
who will become the slaves of righteousness for sanctification as opposed to those who will become slaves of sin for eternal damnation. St. Paul says, For now that you have been freed from sin and have become slaves of God, hopefully, slaves of God, which means inspired by him, guided by him, the benefit that you have leads to just sanctification. This is the benefit, which means every area of our lives is sanctified, is transformed, is influenced by the Spirit. And its end is eternal life that we are already tasting here. But already in this life, if we taste bitterness and ugliness of sin that steals hope, consolation and peace and love from us, which means we are on the straight path to hell. St. Paul says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. On few occasions I heard people committing horrendous crimes or taking their lives. But the thing is that we are all surprised. We shouldn't. It's written here. Instead, who is the happy one, the blessed one? And the first psalm that we hear today says like this. Blessed the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked nor walks in the way of sinners, nor sits in the company of insolent. Do you realize that first three phrases about the psalm referring to the blessed man is not what he does good, but he is able to say no to this. It's not good for me. No to that because it's not good for me. No to this. It's not like saying yes to everything. The psalmist says, blessed the man who is able to say, no, this is not good for me because it destroys my life of prayer. No to this company because it's not going to help me in the long run. We know what brings sanctification and consolation and comfort. Even though we may be disliked and we may uh, create some waves and the separation might come, but is for salvation ultimately. And the Lord, as I always explained, leaves us free those who want to embrace him and his path and those who would prefer to live differently because ultimately we are loved by him and love makes us free.